Good morning on the sixth Sunday of Epiphany. You're listening to a live broadcast from Lutheran Memorial Church in Pierre. Lutheran Memorial is located at the corner of Nicolette and Prospect, just west of our state capitol building. The minister here at Lutheran Memorial is Senior Pastor Craig Wexler. There'll be special music this morning by our bell choir under the direction of Marla Anderson. Today's organist is Lori Kennecke. Hymn numbers this morning are 582, 654, 597, and 604. Our worship service is about to begin, and our opening hymn will be Holy Spirit Ever Dwelling, number 582 in the ELW Red Hymnal. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful February morning. Kind of hard to believe that it's in the 50s on February 11th and 12th. Amen? Amen. I was talking to Marcy and Mike Long. They brought it back from Florida with them. You just, you guys need to go down there again next week. Come on back and bring it on back. So glad to have you guys here in worship this morning. Just a couple quick announcements starting today after worship and again on Tuesday over the noon hour. We are starting our Book of Revelation Bible study. If you have no idea what Revelation actually says, or even if you've read it 10, 12 times and you still think you figured it out, you probably haven't. So I invite anyone who is interested in being a part of that um, today following worship. Uh, Thelma brought some of the Branding Iron Caramel Rolls, so you can't say that you need to rush off to breakfast because it's out there for you. Um, Come on here in the sanctuary and we will start that study right after worship. Also, uh, those of you that have checked the box, those clipboards that went around about a month ago that checked the box for being a part of the hospitality team, that meeting is tomorrow night, this Monday at 6 p.m. in the narthex. Uh, Even if you didn't see the clipboard, but you are a person that likes people, you are a person that naturally enjoys welcoming people in and being a part of that process, come tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Also, our Phase 1 and Phase 2 teams are going to be bringing some good news to you guys very shortly. I'm not going to give you any more than a teaser about that, but their work continues and good news is coming your guys' way. Um, And the last announcement that I have full permission to share, which is also phenomenal news, if you guys remember a number of months ago, uh, Kelly Nelson, uh, Kelly and Anthony Nelson, members of our church for a very long time, Kelly came to the pulpit and shared her story about her need of a kidney transplant. Um, This past week, Anthony, her husband, uh, gave a generous gift. He was able to donate one of his own kidneys. He successfully went through surgery, and there is a recipient in this world that now has life because of Anthony, and it moves Kelly way up the list now. So hold Kelly in prayer, hold both of them in prayer, Anthony for his healing, and Kelly and her patience as her turn is uh comes sooner than later so wanted to share that with you guys family gave permission to share that so hold them in prayer with that being said i invite those who are able to please rise we begin as we always do in confession and forgiveness those of you that remember the good old green hymnals or those of you that are in setting three of the red hymnals we have our liturgy of the past Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We begin with silence to reflect. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and 
therefore uh, called to ordain minister of Church of Christ. You should think I should memorize this. I've done this for 14 years. By his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is Holy Spirit Ever Dwelling, number 582 in our red hymnals. 582. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people on earth. And peace to God's people. Lord be with you. Let us join together in our prayer of the day. O oh God, the strength of all who hope in you, because we are weak mortals, we accomplish nothing good without you. Help us to see and understand the things we ought to do, and give us grace and power to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We have the bell choir with us this morning. Thank you, Marla and team. And I know it's always an open invitation. If any of you want to try bell ringing, I encourage you to do. I started music years ago by dinging the bells. So seek Mar Marla if you're ever interested in helping. We continue with readings this morning. Um, all right, good morning. The first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. Moses said to the people, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your hearts turn away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish you shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Choose life so that, you are descended, so that your descendants may live, loving your Lord, the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give your ancestors to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. 
The psalm is Psalm 119, 1 through 8. Please read responsibly. Happy are those, or happy are they whose way is blameless, who follow the teaching of the Lord. Happy are they who observe your decrees and seek you with all heart. Who never do any wrong, but always walk in your ways. Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I may keep your statutes. I will thank you with a true heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh as infants of Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are, not of the f- are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely humans? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave you growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the Alleluia verse and the reading of the Gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? gospel comes to us today from the book of Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Matthew chapter 5. Now Jesus said to the disciples, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The word of the Lord. Amen. 
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon title is Good Luck, because when you hear that text, well, good luck. Amen? In fact, this is one text that is read in the church here that has absolutely no gospel. There is absolutely no good news in what I just read to you. But what we should also take note is that what I just read to you is exactly word for word the red letters of Jesus' own words. So before we start thinking to ourselves, by golly, deep down inside, I'm going to come up with a better solution to everything that was just said, because I need to be righteous in God's eyes, I need to make it right. You know, I, I, I think we've been through these moments. The truth is, Jesus is giving you God's law. Fully and through, and there is no negotiating it. The truth is, is we live our lives with this assumption that we have free will. Amen? In fact, we go all the way back to our theological days in which your Sunday school brought you all the theology you ever needed to know. No, we did not. When we go back to those moments and we talk about that creation story and God gave Adam and Eve, he gave them free will. He gave them the ability to choose. He did do that. We have will. You have the choice to come to church this morning. Amen? You have the choice to grab one of those caramel rolls there in the narthex, whether you wanted to or not. Amen? Actually, now there's a great example of where that will starts to break down, right? I looked at Thelma, I said, Thelma, you get to make these every single day at work. You must have incredible willpower to be able to say no, because at the end of the day, it's a choice whether it goes in your mouth, right? But the truth be told is we are bound to our sin. We're going to step away from the caramel rolls for a minute, because we go deeper with this text. We are bound to our sins. When Jesus says, when he reminds us of the law in those opening words of this part of chapter 5, he says, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Whew! I haven't murdered anyone yet, so I'm still good, Jesus. I'm still good, right? But we are bound to our will. We are bound to our sinful nature. We are bound to that absolute primal nature deep down within. I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts this week, and the authors, they're going back and forth, and they're talking about parsing out these laws, and they're talking about, yeah, okay, the murder one, 99.9% of the people in our congregation are going to be good with that one. However, when we go back to our impulses, even in the beginning of our parenting days, there's this great example that I know Carmen and I, specifically myself, could completely resonate with. I remember in our early uh, birthing classes when uh, Carmen was pregnant with Elise, our first daughter, they were talking about how there's going to be a point in time in which you have to remember that you do not shake the child, right? And as these podcast guys were talking, I was completely locked in. I had the exact same thought. Why on God's green earth would you ever shake your baby, right? Until you have colic. That child has colic. Our daughter, Ellie, had colic for a very long time. And it's talking about nights on end, hour after hour. You could set your watch. 6.45 p.m. till 2 a.m. would be nonstop, like jaw-quivering crying over and over again. How would you dare not shake your child? You would never shake your child, right? But I also remember in those early weeks and those first appointments, I remember the doctor flat out saying, do you have any anxious thoughts towards your child? Do you have anger that seems to be unchecked? Are you doing okay? And I found myself thinking, why are you asking these questions? And then we realized why when that midnight hour would come around, Carmen, who had a much more calmer demeanor, would hold Ellie, and I would walk the dog for hours on end, right? We ask ourselves, thou shalt not murder, who would ever shake their child until you meet the person in prison who's done it? It's that guttural sin that we're bound to. Walking with combat veterans, a few of my dear friends who have had to make that ultimate decision, that life-changing decision in the heat of battle, 
to ask and to navigate, to process the language, to hear the justification, to hear the story, to try to make sense of it, that something, that guttural feeling none of us, very few of us, could ever really empathize with, and to give grace and mercy into that conversation. Again, it's a reminder of that bound to our sin nature that we have. But of course, Jesus takes it further. He doesn't just talk about murder, right? In fact, he says, but I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother and his, or, or sister is subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, which is answerable in the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Well, who of us has never chastised or talked ill of a brother or sister behind their backs or to their face? Amen. And the law says that when we are in that broken relationship, when we respond in such a manner, we are, condemn, we are condemned to hell. Now, I know we'd like me to soften the words. You'd like me to sugarcoat the gospel. I'm just reading to you what Jesus says. He goes on, he says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, leave that gift. Don't even think you have the right or the ability to come to the altar. Don't even think that you have the ability to correct it yourself with your proper sacrifice or your offerings. You need to leave that at the door and go solve your problems first. Make an attempt at righteousness with your neighbor before you ever enter into God's house, is what Jesus is saying. Yet how many of us are sitting here today and have broken relationships on the outside of the, do outside of the doors that we did not check as we came in. Amen? We've been there. We do that. It's, again, we are bound to our sin. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's why you should never go to the beach. <laughs> Don't ever go to the beach. Carmen wants us to go to the beach again in April. Don't go to the beach. Don't go to the beach. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It's easy for us to chuckle when I say we shouldn't go to the beach but I know for a fact that there are people all throughout our community that are profoundly addicted to pornography, profoundly addicted to inappropriate relationships with other coworkers or people in their midst. How do I know this? Because I'm dear friends with our therapists in this community. I'm dear friends with other, uh, other professionals that have to navigate these cases and these conflicts with families and individuals. Just found out yesterday that we passed a bill in this state that actually you have to have a digital footprint to be able to acknowledge that you are of appropriate age to log on to what we call pornographic websites. I would say that's not even close to being enough, but at least it's a boundary of sorts, right? There's a nine-year-old in our community that is addicted, so profoundly addicted that has to look at it for at least an hour a day to feel better about themselves. A nine-year-old. But we chuckle and say that if your eye causes you to sin, you should pluck it out. Oh, uh, that's, just, that's, that's just hyperbole, Jesus. And Jesus is bold in that. But that was a law once upon a time. What Jesus is getting at is that as we are bound to our sin, no matter how hard we try to make ourselves righteous, no matter how much we try to make ourselves right with God, we're always still attached to that sin. As Jesus goes on further and he talks about divorce, the subject of divorce, every single congregation in our culture has families that empathize with that subject of divorce. The reason why Jesus is reminding us that we are bound to our sin is no matter what, even if you enter into the perfect, best relationship beyond that original divorce, whether we like it or not, we're still attached emotionally. And sometimes even physically as we still negotiate the holidays especially if we had children negotiating mixed families is difficult work amen amen and no matter how hard we try 
we're still bound to our sin in the midst of all of it. In the midst of all of it. And in our response, in our response to this bound conscience of our sin, we take it a step further as a culture. I was reading a phenomenal book recently, and it talks about how we in America are now three full generations away from, or separated from genuine nationwide suffering. To anyone who has loved ones or they themselves maybe are old enough to go back to the days of the Korean War and World War II, we as a nation are three full generations removed from genuine nationwide suffering. And that is an absolute blessing. And I would never wish, that, or wish, wish suffering upon us, but what I have observed time and time again is we, bound to our sin, create our own suffering. Amen? We create our own suffering. We create our own polarization. We make up our own arguments about absolutely everything. We are genuinely, legitimately in an identity crisis as a culture. We're in an identity crisis about what it means to be successful. We are in an identity crisis as to mean what it means to be right and what it means to be wrong. We are in a political identity crisis. We are in a medical identity crisis. We are in a sexual identity crisis. Every single aspect of our being is attached to our bound conscience to sin. And that's why we have such movements, whether we want to call it social justice, civil justice, unrest, whatever we want to call it, we have movements. And we justify every single movement saying that we are right, saying that we are peaceful, saying that we are correct and you are wrong. I don't care who you are. Every time we draw that line in the sand of this is what it means to be righteous and that is what it means to be unrighteous, this is what it means to be oppressed and this is what it means to be the oppressor, anytime we draw that line in the sand, we are wrong. Both sides of the argument are wrong. Why? Because each of those responses are bound to our what? To our sin. And that is why we go back to the context of what Jesus is saying this morning. Chapters 5 and 6 is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This whole section started two weeks ago. It started as they gathered on the hillside. Thousands of people gathered to hear Jesus give his public sermon. And of course, he starts that sermon with the Beatitudes. Blessed are they. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the weak. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor. All those things that for many of the people on that hillside could identify with, and the rest of us, if we can't identify with it, by golly, we're going to try to make the correction. I'm going to be a meek and lowly person. Amen? No, you're not. No, you're not. Because that is a humility most of us can never truly enter into. And then he took it a step further last week. Uh, Jay Mickelson, I heard, did a fine job in reminding us what it means to be the salt of the earth. And Jesus brings in that salt of the earth. He's talking to the people on the hillside and he's saying, as you hear my truth, as you hear my word given to you, that truth sets you free. That truth makes you salt. And that saltiness needs to be shared amongst all that encounter you. You are also a light that is put on a lampstand, not hidden under a basket. If you have the truth and you are the light that others uh, see, that means you are bringing them out of the darkness. You are shining light into their darkness. You cannot be hidden under a basket. Jesus takes it further and he says, if you are a city, you are not only just a city, you're a city on the hill. Literally on that Sermon on the Mount, he is turning those people into the city that everyone else is going to witness. And that witness is going to be truth rooted in what Jesus is telling them. You are not hidden in some valley, you are a city on a hill. And Jesus looks at his disciples as he finishes the sermon and he brings all of God's wrath and law down upon him which is why you have no gospel at all in today's reading. But we good old Lutherans need to end with an ounce of gospel, amen? It's about the context. We are bound to our sins. God intended in his creation for you to be free. 
He intended in his creation for you to have free ability to make the choices and that your choices would always be righteous ones. But due to the fall of man, due to sin of the world, due to that moment in the Garden of Eden, every choice that we make is bound by our sin. Even on the best of days, even the most righteous, best, well-intended decision we make is still connected to the brokenness of who we are. And because of that, Jesus takes on a very unique role. Jesus is not just the police officer. He's not just the jury. He's not just the judge. He's not just the executioner. He's all of the above. All put together. He is the representation of a, si- of a system that we'll never understand. We as the sinners, we as the broken, we who are bound to our sin, we are dragged out into the courtyard, we are on bended knees, sitting in the mud, and the king of all kings is there with his sword removed from his sheath and his sword at the base of our neck, and he looks at each and every one of us and he says, I love you. I love you, and he puts that sword back in his sheath. And he helps you out of the mud. He helps us out of the mud. He puts the sword away. And he says, instead of death, today I invite you to the table. You're going to come inside of the castle. You're going to sit down at that table and you are welcome to the meal. If you actually enter into that mindset and imagine what that moment might be like, I imagine when you enter that table, into that room, into that banquet, you walk away absolutely changed, amen? And that is the misconception of Christ that we have today. We absolutely walk away changed when we encounter Christ. Let us actually be detached from that bondage to our sin. Let us for a moment set the sin aside and say, good Lord, thank you for inviting me to that table. You have to go back into Scripture. Every single encounter that Jesus has with every single character in that Scripture walks away changed. They do not walk away subjective, or being subjective to God's law. They do not walk away saying, that's nice, Jesus accepted me, he took me out of the dirt, and everything is well, and I can go back to my life. The prostitute did not walk back down to the corner after encountering Jesus, amen? The thief did not go back to thievery after encountering Jesus, amen? Every single person that Christ is encounters walks away changed. And yes, they're still bound to their sin, but yes, they make every single attempt to live life in response to just having been invited into that banquet to eat with the king who saved them. So how do we live in response to that? You do not have the ability to drag someone out into the mud and take the sword, put it at their neck, and put it away. You do not have the ability to save others. But you do have the ability to share with them how your life has been changed and invite them to the banquet as well. The king leaves that door wide open for each of us to enter in the gates. And all we can do is invite them to the banquet where we are reminded that we have a life that is loved, a life that is changed, a life that is forgiven. Next week, we go up to the hill in which Jesus is transformed on that Transfiguration Sunday, and that is what begins our Lenten journey. It makes sense that Christ brings us to our knees with a sermon as we enter into Lent, the season of self-reflection, the season of repentance, the season of change, the season of the cross. So brothers and sisters in Christ, come off your knees, come into the banquet, sit down at the feast, and walk away knowing that you are changed because of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of the day is a new commandment, number 664 in your blue hymnals. If you're following in your hymnals, the blue hymnal number 664. Please rise.
Let us profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At a moment, we join in song as the offering plates come around. I did not find ushers this morning, so if there's a couple volunteers, please come forward. And also another reminder in our offering, the noisy offering here this, uh, this month and in the months ahead is setting, or offsetting the costs of school lunches for families that are really struggling right now. Every child in our school district gets fed, but we are in debt of over $1,000 in our school district. So any, uh, any loose change that you place in that noisy offering is helping those schools feed our children. Please rise. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and dreams of all, them with the prayers that we now offer. Grace our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Let us pray. Merciful Father, all we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we ask you to enter into our lives this day and we ask you to help us understand what it means that you have come to truly bestow mercy upon us. As we near our Lenten journey, we are taken to task with some of the most difficult words in Scripture. But it is in these holy words of Scripture, your word, that we also find the rest of the story that brings us to our knees and reminds us just how much we needed you to come to us through your Son. Help us to live in proper response to your gift, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. God of creation, we ask you to be with all the people of the world this day and to bring wholeness to the body of Christ. We especially pray for all those who died this past week, the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, all throughout the Middle East. We pray for their loved ones. We pray for the rescue operations. We pray for survivors clinging to life. Help us to hold them in prayer along with those struggling here in this community as well, the hungry, the poor, the mentally disheartened neighbors who are desperate for clarity and hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of strength and healing, we ask you to continue being present with all of our families on our prayer list, especially Patty Pearson, Monty Curry, Jeannie Glott, and Anthony and Kelly Nelson. Lord, as always, we also ask you to be present with our servicemen and women throughout this world who are giving themselves for our security and freedom, and we especially pray for their loved ones back at home. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending hymn is, O Christ, Our Hope, number 604. Christ our hope, our hearts these are creation's mighty Lord, Redeemer of the fallen world, my holy love outpoured, my holy love outpoured. How vast your mercy to accept the burden of our sin. Through all eternity. 
Again, the book of Revelation starts here in a few minutes. We go in peace, love, and serve the Lord. This concludes our Sunday morning worship service from Lutheran Royal Church in Pier. You can join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Saturday evenings at 5.30 p.m. for our contemporary service, or Wednesday evenings at 6.30. If you're unable to attend any of our three worship services, you're invited to tune in to our live radio broadcast at 9 a.m. each Sunday morning here on KGFX 1060 a.m., 103.1 f.m., or just go to DRG News and click on Listen Live. Sunday and Wednesday evening services are also live streamed on our LMC Facebook page and you can catch our sermon podcast on an app of your choice or right on our website under the media tab. Our radio broadcast do rely on financial support from members of Lutheran Memorial Church and other regular listeners and viewers. If you would like to sponsor our radio broadcast in honor of a special occasion or in memory of a loved one, just contact our church office at 224-8608. So now on behalf of Pastor Craig Wexler and the congregation here at Luther Memorial, we extend our prayers for you and yours for God's care and guidance throughout this coming week. Amen.